Chapter 9 of Thuvia, Maid of Mars. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Thuvia, Maid of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 9 The Battle in the Plain. The distance from the bottom of the funnel to the floor of the chamber beneath it could not have been great, for all three of the victims of Tario's wrath alighted unscathed. Carthoris, still clasping Thuvia tightly to his breast, came to the ground cat-like, upon his feet, breaking the shock for the girl. Scarce had his feet touched the rough stone flagging of this new chamber than his sword flashed out ready for instant use. But though the room was lighted, there was no sign of enemy about. Carthoris turned toward Jav. The man was pasty white with fear. "'What is to be our fate?' asked the Heliumite. "'Tell me, man! Shake off your terror long enough to tell me, so I may be prepared to sell my life and that of the Princess of Parth as dearly as possible.' "'Come all!' whispered Jav. We are to be devoured by Komal. Your deity? asked Carthoris. The Lotharian nodded his head. Then he pointed toward a low doorway at one end of the chamber. From thence will he come upon us. Lay aside your puny sword, fool. It will but enrage him the more, and make our sufferings the worse. Carthoris smiled, gripping his longsword the more firmly. Presently Jav gave a horrified moan, at the same time pointing toward the door. "'He has come!' he whimpered. Carthoris and Thuvia looked in the direction the Lotharian had indicated, expecting to see some strange and fearful creature in human form. But to their astonishment they saw the broad head and great maned shoulders of a huge banth, the largest that either had ever seen. Slowly and with dignity the mighty beast advanced into the room. Jav had fallen to the floor, and was wriggling his body in the same servile manner that he had adopted toward Tario. He spoke to the fierce beast as he would have spoken to a human being, pleading with it for mercy. Carthoris stepped between Thuvia and the Banth, his sword ready to contest the beast's victory over them. Thuvia turned toward Jav. "'Is this Komal, your god?' she asked. Jav nodded affirmatively. The girl smiled, and then, brushing past Carthoris, she stepped swiftly toward the growling carnivore. In low, firm tones she spoke to it, as she had spoken to the banths of the Golden Cliffs and the scavengers before the walls of Lothar. The beast ceased its growling. With lowered head and cat-like purr, it came slinking to the girl's feet. Thuvia turned toward Carthoris. "'It is but a banth,' she said. "'We have nothing to fear from it.' Carthoris smiled. "'I did not fear it,' he replied. "'For I, too, believed it to be only a banth, and I have my longsword.' Jav sat up and gazed at the spectacle before him the slender girl weaving her fingers in the tawny mane of the huge creature that he had thought divine, while Komal rubbed his hideous snout against her side. "'So this is your god,' laughed Thuvia. Jav looked bewildered. He scarce knew whether he dared chance offending Komal or not, for so strong is the power of superstition that even though we know that we have been reverencing a sham, yet still we hesitate to admit the validity of our new-found convictions. "'Yes,' he said, "'this is Komal. For ages the enemies of Tario have been hurled into his pit to fill his maw, for Komal must be fed.' "'Is there any way out of this chamber, to the avenues of the city?' asked Carthoris. Jav shrugged. "'I do not know,' he replied. "'Never have I been here before.' nor ever have I cared to do so. Come, suggested Thuvia, let us explore. 
there must be a way out. Together the three approached the doorway through which Komal had entered the apartment that was to have witnessed their deaths. Beyond was a low-roofed lair, with a small door at the far end. This, to their delight, opened to the lifting of an ordinary latch, letting them into a circular arena, surrounded by tiers of seats. "'Here is where Komal is fed in public,' explained the Jav. Had Tario dared, it would have been here that our fates had been sealed. But he feared too much thy keen blade, red man, and so he hurled us all downward to the pit. I did not know how closely connected were the two chambers. Now we may easily reach the avenues and the city gates. Only the bowmen may dispute the right of way, and, knowing their secret, I doubt that they will have power to harm us. Another door led to a flight of stairs that rose from the arena level upward through the seats to an exit at the back of the hall. Beyond this was a straight, broad corridor, running directly through the palace to the gardens at the side. No one appeared to question them as they advanced, mighty Kumal pacing by the girl's side. "'Where are the people of the palace? The Jeddak's retinue?' asked Carthoris. Even in the city streets, as we came through, I scarce saw sign of a human being. Yet all about are the evidences of a mighty population. Jav sighed. Poor Lothar, he said. It is indeed a city of ghosts. There are scarce a thousand of us left, who once were numbered in the millions. Our great city is peopled by the creatures of our own imaginings. For our own needs... We do not take the trouble to materialize these peoples of our brain, yet they are apparent to us. Even now I see great throngs lining the avenues, hastening to and fro in the round of their duties. I see women and children laughing on the balconies. These we are forbidden to materialize, but yet I see them. They are here. But why not? he mused. No longer need I fear Tario. He has done his worst and failed. Why not indeed? Stay, friends, he continued. Would you see Lothar in all her glory? Carthoris and Thuvia nodded their assent, more out of courtesy than because they fully grasped the import of his mutterings. Jav gazed at them penetratingly for an instant, then, with a wave of his hand, cried, Look! The sight that met them was awe-inspiring. Where before there had been naught but deserted pavements and scarlet swords, yawning windows and tenantless doors, now swarmed a countless multitude of happy, laughing people. "'It is the past,' said Jav in a low voice. "'They do not see us, but they live the old, dead past of ancient Lothar.' the dead and crumbled Lothar of antiquity, which stood upon the shore of Throxus, mightiest of the five oceans. See those fine, upstanding men swinging along the broad avenue? See the young girls and the women smile upon them? See the men greet them with love and respect? Those be seafarers, coming up from their ships which lie at the quays at the city's edge. Brave men, they... Oh, but the glory of Lothar has faded. See their weapons? They alone bore arms, for they crossed the five seas to strange places where dangers were. With their passing, passed the martial spirit of the Lotharians, leaving, as the ages rolled by, a race of spineless cowards. We hated war and so we trained not our youth in warlike ways. Thus followed our undoing, for when the seas dried and the green hordes encroached upon us, we could do naught but flee. But we remembered the seafaring bowmen of the days of our glory. It is the memory of these which we hurl upon our enemies. As Jav ceased speaking, the picture faded and once more the three took up their way toward the distant city gates along deserted avenues. Twice they sighted Lotharians of flesh and blood. At sight of them, 
and the huge banth which they must have recognized as Komal, the citizens turned and fled. "'They will carry word of our flight to Tario,' cried Jav, "'and soon he will send his bowmen after us. Let us hope that our theory is correct, and that their shafts are powerless against minds cognizant of their unreality. Otherwise we are doomed!' Explain, Red Man, to the woman the truths that I have explained to you, that she may meet the arrows with a stronger counter-suggestion of immunity. Carthoris did as Jav bid him, but they came to the great gates without sign of pursuit developing. Here Jav set in motion the mechanism that rolled the huge, wheel-like gate aside, and a moment later the three, accompanied by the banth, stepped out into the plain before Lothar. Scarce had they covered a hundred yards when the sound of many men shouting rose behind them. As they turned, they saw a company of bowmen debouching upon the plain from the gate through which they had but just passed. Upon the wall above the gate there were a number of Lotharians, among whom Jav recognized Tario. The Jeddak stood glaring at them, evidently concentrating all the forces of his trained mind upon them that he was making a supreme effort to render his imaginary creatures deadly was apparent. Jav turned white and commenced to tremble. At the crucial moment he appeared to lose the courage of his conviction. The great banth turned back toward the advancing bowman and growled. Carthoris placed himself between Thuvia and the enemy and, facing them, awaited the outcome of the charge. Suddenly an inspiration came to Carthoris. "'Hurl your own bowmen against Tarios!' he cried to Jav. "'Let us see a materialized battle between two mentalities!' The suggestion seemed to hearten the Lotharian, and in another moment the three stood behind solid ranks of huge bowmen who hurled taunts and menaces at the advancing company emerging from the walled city. Jav was a new man the moment his battalions stood between him and Tario. One could almost have sworn the man believed these creatures of his strange hypnotic power to be real flesh and blood. With hoarse battle cries they charged the bowmen of Tario. Barbed shafts flew thick and fast, men fell, and the ground was red with gore. Carthoris and Thuvia had difficulty in reconciling the reality of it all with their knowledge of the truth. They saw Utan after Utan march from the gate in perfect step to reinforce the outnumbered company which Tario had first sent forth to arrest them. They saw Jav's forces grow correspondingly, until all about them rolled a sea of fighting, cursing warriors, and the dead lay in heaps about the field. Jav and Tario seemed to have forgotten all else beside the struggling bowmen that surged to and fro, filling the broad field between the forest and the city. The wood loomed close behind Thuvia and Carthoris. The latter cast a glance toward Jav. Come, he whispered to the girl, let them fight out their empty battle. Neither evidently has power to harm the other. They are like two controversialists hurling words at one another. While they are engaged, we may as well be devoting our energies to an attempt to find the passage through the cliffs to the plain beyond. As he spoke, Jav, turning from the battle for an instant, caught his words. He saw the girl move to accompany the Heliumite. A cunning look leaped to the Lotharian's eyes. The thing that lay beyond that look had been deep in his heart since first he had lain eyes upon Thuvia of Parth. He had not recognized it, however, until now that she seemed about to pass out of his existence. He centered his mind upon the Heliumite and the girl for an instant. Carthoris saw Thuvia of Parth step forward with outstretched hand. He was surprised at this sudden softening toward him, and it was with a full heart that he let his fingers close upon hers, as together they turned away from forgotten Lothar into the woods and bent their steps toward the distant mountains. As the Lotharian had turned toward them, Thuvia had been surprised to hear Carthora suddenly voice a new plan. "'Remain here with Jav,' she had heard him say, "'while I go to search for the passage through the cliffs.' 
She had dropped back in surprise and disappointment, for she knew that there was no reason why she should not have accompanied him. Certainly she should have been safer with him than left here alone with the Lotharian. And Jav watched the two and smiled his cunning smile. When Carthoris had disappeared within the wood, Thuvia seated herself apathetically upon the scarlet sward to watch the seemingly interminable struggles of the bowmen. The long afternoon dragged its weary way toward darkness, and still the imaginary legions charged and retreated. The sun was about to set when Tario commenced to withdraw his troops slowly toward the city. His plan for cessation of hostilities through the night evidently met with Jav's entire approval for he caused his forces to form themselves in orderly utans and marched just within the edge of the wood, where they were soon busily engaged in preparing their evening meal and spreading down their sleeping silks and furs for the night. Thuvia could scarce repress a smile as she noted the scrupulous care with which Jav's imaginary men attended to each tiny detail of deportment, as truly as if they had been flesh and blood. Sentries were posted between the camp and the city, officers clanked hither and thither issuing commands, and seeing to it that they were properly carried out. Thuvia turned toward Jav. "'Why is it,' she asked, "'that you observe such careful nicety in the regulation of your creatures, when Tario knows quite as well as you that they are but figments of your brain? Why not prevent them simply to dissolve into thin air until you again require their futile service?' "'You do not understand them,' replied Jav. While they exist, they are real. I do but call them into being now, and in a way direct their general actions. But thereafter, until I dissolve them, they are as actual as you or I. Their officers command them, under my guidance. I am the general, that is all. And the psychological effect upon the enemy is far greater than were I to treat them merely as substanceless vagaries. Then, too continued the Lotharian, there is always the hope, which with us is little short of belief, that some day these materializations will merge into the real, that they will remain, some of them, after we have dissolved their fellows, and that thus we shall have discovered a means for perpetuating our dying race. Some there are who claim already to have accomplished the thing, it is generally supposed that the etherealists have quite a few among their number, who are permanent materializations. It is even said that such is Tario, but that cannot be, for he existed before we have discovered the full possibilities of suggestion. There are others among us who insist that none of us is real, that we could not have existed all these ages without material food and water, had we ourselves been material. Although I am a realist, I rather incline towards this belief myself. It seems well and sensibly based upon the belief that our ancient forebears developed before their extinction such wondrous mentalities that some of the stronger minds among them lived after the death of their bodies, that we are but the deathless minds of individuals long dead. It would appear possible, and yet, in so far as I am concerned, I have all the attributes of corporeal existence. I sleep, I eat, he paused, casting a meaning look upon the girl. I love. Thuvia could not mistake the palpable meaning of his words and expression. She turned away with a little shrug of disgust that was not lost upon the Lotharian. He came close to her and seized her arm. Why not Jav? he cried. Who more honorable than the second of the world's most ancient race? Your Heliumite? He is gone. He has deserted you to your fate to save himself. Come, be Javs! Thuvia of Parth rose to her full height, her lifted shoulders turned toward the man, her haughty chin upraised, a scornful twist to her lips. You lie, she said quietly. The Heliumite knows less of disloyalty than he knows of fear, and of fear he is as ignorant as the unhatched young. Then where is he? taunted the Lotharian. I tell you, he has fled the valley. He has left you to your fate. But Jav will see that it is a pleasant one. 
Tomorrow we shall return into Lothar at the head of my victorious army, and I shall be Jeddak, and you shall be my consort. Come! And he attempted to crush her to his breast. The girl struggled to free herself, striking at the man with her metal armlets. Yet still he drew her toward him, until both were suddenly startled by a hideous growl that rumbled from the dark woods close behind them. End of chapter 9